Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on our foundation level sample paper discussions. We are talking about the questions on the set C and have recently completed the question of the chapter four. And now it's time for us to jump into the chapter five and we'll be looking forward to understand more about the sample questions from this particular set on the question number five, uh, that's chapter number five. And just for your kind quick reminder that this chapter will have nine questions out of 40. So together chapter four and five makes it up to 20 questions out of 40. So one among the critical chapters as well. So make sure that you pay attention to all the criticality of this particular uh, chapters, which will be very helpful at points to give you all the understanding what you need to get a passing score at the same time. So let's jump into the very first question of this chapter, which is to talk about question number 30. You are working as a tester on an online banking system. Availability is considered one of the top products that is quality risk for the system. That means the system must be available all the time as you're working on the banking system. People or your customer shouldn't be facing problem when they want to quickly check their available balance or they want to make a credit or debit transactions. Now you'll find a reproducible failure that results in customers losing their connections to the bank website when transferring funds between common types of accounts and being unable to reconnect for between three and five minutes. Now that's one failure what you observed related to availability, right? Now which of the following would be a good summary for a defect report for this failure and one that captures both the essence of the failure and its impact on the stakeholder. Now, the very first point I would like to tell you here that if you start reading the scenario, you may think that are we talking about availability testing and have we covered that in our syllabus and foundation? No, not at all. But the point is, are we talking about defect report at the end of the day and have we covered that in chapter five? Yes, of course. So the question was not about availability testing. The question was just to give you a particular scenario and that could be anything, right? That's not a part of the syllabus. The syllabus consists of what is a defect report. And that's what we should be concentrating on because our subject is the defect report here, right? So let's look at the option one after the other and try understanding that what could be the best thing which gives the essence of, of uh, the failure and its impact on the stakeholder both as a part of the defect report. So the option A you have is web server logs shows error that is 0x44ab27 when running test uh, 7.005 which is not an expected error message in slash temporary file system. Right, that's a particular the directory and location. So here it may tell me that yes, this is a failure which is happening uh, when the user is trying to interact or make a transfer between the similar types of account, but uh, that's not giving any impact on the stakeholder, right? That does not make any sense. So talking about option B, developers have introduced major availability defect, which will seriously upset our customers. Now that's a very common contradiction uh, to that particular statement which we think have discussed in the chapter one that you should not be pointing your finger towards the developer having a conflict. Rather it should be more on like the product not to the people right and it's not something as a good summary where we are talking about uh, you know pointing that finger on the developer stating that hey look at your work you have done a lot of things wrong rather you should say hey look at the code it is not working right it's not someone who is really doing to do that so the summary does not provide developers or managers with the necessary information at this time and it is also attacking the developers directly and that's not a protocol we should be following from psychology of testing talking about the option c performance is slow and reliability flaky under load that clearly says that we are not talking about availability, we are talking about performance parameters, which is covered as a part of performance testing. And here in this scenario, we are no longer talking about performance testing, rather we are talking about uh, availability testing. So it should talk about being available rather than performance being fast and slow. Now we're left with just one option, but let's give it a look on that as well. The question number D says, 
Typical funds transfer transaction results in termination of the customer session with a delay in availability when attempting to reconnect. Now that makes pretty much sense, uh, which clearly tells me all that thing what we really need. The summary is giving a very good essence of uh, the failure and its impact, where the first part is telling me the failure, the typical fund transfer transaction results in the termination of a session, and the impact is that the delay in the availability, uh, there is a delay in the availability when trying to reconnect. Right, So that can be a good summary. In the description, all you can do is write the details like it takes three to five minutes of time when reconnecting and it's not available for that duration. So without thinking a lot about this question, the right answer here is D, typical funds transfer transactions results in termination of customer session with a delay in availability when attempting to reconnect. Now that is what we were looking for and that's the right answer. All right, so let's look into the next question, which is to talk about question number 31. You are testing a mobile app that allows users to find a nearby restaurant and based on the type of food they want to eat. Uh, it's more of like a good application and making me feel a little hungry right now. Consider the following list of test cases. Priorities include the, how the priorities are defined is a smaller number is the high priority, like one is highest, two is medium, and three is low. And their respective logical dependencies is also given to you in the following format. So here, if you see, we got a very good looking table without lines. <laughs> and it has the test case ID like one, two, three, four, five. And we have the name of the conditions that is select type of food, select restaurant, get directions, call the restaurant and make reservation. And there are several priorities, right? So test case three and four are with highest priority. Test case two is the medium priority and one and five are with low priority. And logical dependency, which clearly states us that how your test case is dependent on the other test case. And this dependency clearly tells us one thing, that until unless this test is executed, you cannot run the one which you're selecting right now. For example, if I pick the test case number four, it says it is high priority one, but it is dependent on two. That clearly means that until unless two is executed, well, four cannot be executed, right? This is what I mean to say the logical dependency that four, test case number four cannot be executed until unless two is executed. No matter the priority of a four is one and the priority of two is two, okay? Because dependencies must be removed in order to run. It's as simple as that to say that you cannot log in without registering on an application. Point, right? No matter the login has highest priority and sign up has medium priority, but until unless you sign up, how can you log in? That makes sense, right? That's the logical dependency all about. Now let's look at the cushion. Which of the following is a possible test execution schedule that considers both priorities and dependencies? That's what we need to do, boss. When you're giving a dependency to us with the priority, we need to consider both of them. So now let's start solving it before looking at the options. That's the best technique to do it. So let's start with the highest priority test cases first, because that's the something which you'll be executing first. So three and four are my priority one, that is highest priority. And if I go to the logical dependency of that, what I see, both of them are dependent on two. That means two should be executed before I can execute the priority one item. And both of them. So if even one was independent, I could have executed that at least but now I see both of them are dependent on two. If I go to two, I see further dependency there that two is dependent on one. So that means in order to run two, one should be executed. So I go to one and I see that it is a low priority test, but has no dependency. All right, that's great. So I'll be running test case one. Once it is done executing, that dependency has been removed. So I'll execute two and then I'll come to three and four because now they are independent and I can run three and four in any order, right? Because both of them are at the same priority. Don't go by the sequence. 
3 and 4 both are p1 so if you run 3 and then 4 or if you run 4 then 3 it's the same so that's done and now it's time for us to look at the 5 which is remaining so that's anyways independent now because 2 is executed so yes 5 can be executed at the last so the final sequence what we have here is 1 2 3 4 or 4 3 and then 5 so let's see which option is meeting these expectations uh, we have three options a b d which starts with uh, test case one and two right very conflicting and if you see uh, further option a changes right it says three and five then four no we don't we don't have to run five before a high priority test case right three and four are high priority so should be executed before if you look at c you have uh, that's anyways not a concern for us because it's starting with test case number three that's incorrect and d one two four five again that's incorrect it should be three first before five so our final answer straight forward here is b that is one two four three five okay now very tricky right team because you would think three should be executed first and you'll pick up any other option but here uh, four and three are equal priority so it doesn't make any sense if you execute four first or three first so please take care of that thing otherwise being aware of the concept you can still go wrong all right let's look at one more question from our tutorial today uh, which of the following is common test metric often used to monitor both test preparation and the test execution now that's something really required to think a lot we're talking about the test preparation which is test design and the test execution so which metric do you think will be helpful in both the situations or both the phases of the fundamental test process we've got four matrices here a test case status b defect find or fix rate c test environment preparation and d estimated cost to find the next defect now if you look at all these things right it, it really has a clear picture to you telling you which phase do I belong. For example, let's start from the bottom. Estimated cost to find the next defect. Now estimated cost to find the next de defect are basically reported. Defects are basically reported during test execution, a very common thing, right? So we report defects during test execution. So it's quite particular to the uh, test execution phase alone not during test case preparation and uh, the cost of finding the next effect is available during the test execution only because we get to know the frequency of it by executing several test cases and we get to know the you know difference between or mean time between the failure which tells us that how long we will take again to uh, get to the next effect right so that's only in the test execution doesn't help with the test preparation c test environment preparation again relate this back to your activity where do you prepare your test cases uh, sorry test environment you prepare that in the test design oh are you created in the test implementation because in design phase you design the environment you build the environment as a part of the test implementation phase and that's in that that's not in our question right now b defect find and fix rate purely the test execution phase how many defects are you finding and how frequently the fix, it fixes are happening and that can only be done during test execution alone but when we come to the option a it says test case status now this test case status is used in both the uh, both the phases test preparation because during preparation you will have uh, design phase approved reviewed etc and then no run right no run is a status given to a design test case that it is reviewed ready for execution but not yet executed then the same thing can go further that when the execution starts what's the status whether it is pass fail uh, in progress or you know terminated kind of you know suspended or blocked etc so yes the same status can continue right from test design phase to the execution of course the num amount of status a type of status will be different but yes this is something which can be used in both of the phases that is test preparation and test execution and that's where the right answer here is 
A, the test case status is the metric which can be very well used in the test case preparation as well as test case execution phase, right? So that's all from the new questions from the chapter five right now. We'll be jumping into the remaining questions in our next tutorial. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.